and welcome back. Now today we're going to be talking about two-way radio communication using this module here and this module here. Now these are NRF 24L01, possibly suffix with a plus, but uh, they're all much of the same really. Now these units are particularly cheap, ubiquitous and work like a dream. However, getting the two talking together for a beginner, the absolute basics is something of a jungle. So what I've done is put together this video with a cut down version of the example sketch that comes with this. In fact, there's, there's several um, sample sketches. One's called Getting Started. So what I've actually done is paired it to the bone, put in some comments, just reformatted it a bit and made it do things as simply as I can. As Albert Einstein said, make it as simple as possible, but no simpler. So that's what we're going to end up with. Now, these little units, as I say, are cheap. Um, they're, well, easy to use because the clever people that make the libraries to use these have sort of abstracted all the um, intricacies away. So you don't have to talk to registers or anything. You just say transmit, receive, whatever and it's all very simple now this board as you can see in front of me has got a sort of a, a built-in aerial already so this little bit down the bottom here is in fact um, it's aerial now you can get different sorts to this you can get some that actually have a proper plug-in aerial like you might get say from a walkie-talkie they are more expensive but then again you do get a bigger range as well so these units probably give you a range of well they say about 100 meters in clear space I reckon you'd get 200 meters, frankly, if you were, say, in an open field, right? And these weren't on the ground. They were sort of a meter up from the ground. I reckon you'd probably get 200 meters because, not least, you can set the power on these quite nicely. So now at the moment, I've got them set to absolute minimum power because it's the power consumption of these units that give beginners so much trouble, or at least partly anyway. So I've got it set to the absolute minimum power so I can run it from my Arduino board. Now it only needs 3.3 volts. Let me repeat that. It needs 3.3 volts, not 5. You connect these up to 5, you'll have no transmitter left. So 3.3 it is. Now whilst I am running it from the Arduino, or at least, well it's a Nano. This is a Nano, both of them are exactly the same. It's a Nano put onto a development board but it's the 3.3 volts on here that I'm actually sucking the power out. Now the data sheet says you only need about 13 milliamps when it's um, in receive mode, which takes the most power. Ironically enough, I don't quite understand that. But the power to transmit at the lowest level takes about six or seven milliamps, not a lot. And the range then might be something like 10 feet. As it happens, that suits me rather well because I've got a project in mind that I'm just toying with at the moment, so I do want a limited range. Now, there are alternatives to this. I did think, as you can see at the back here, I've got some of these power things for breadboards. So here's one, and there's another one already set up. So what this is, this is um, a power unit. You put your, your 12 volts in here, and then it's switchable 3.3 or 5 volts. See that? And this side here is always 5 volts, but this one then switches between 3.3 and 5. And the idea is you get this breadboard, which is, well, once again, ubiquitous, and you can find it on eBay all over the place. And they just plug into the holes at the top, three holes, and uh, it's all quite firm and stable. Um, as it happens, I'm not friends with this particular one at the moment, because the 5 volt um, regulator wasn't working. Either I'd blown it up inadvertently, whatever i had to replace that one that's the ams 1117 5 volt version the 3 volt one was okay so i'm thinking how did that blow up hmm, dodgy that anyway so that's working okay now and it is switchable as i say i actually prefer this one over here uh, not least because it's got a nice on off switch there um, it's still got the main 12 volts in doesn't actually say what you can put into it, but you can put 12. As I've been using that. And here, of course, you can change either side to 3.3 or 5 volts, or indeed switch it off just by moving these little jumpers to the right place. So if you put it in the middle, it'd be off. That's 5 volts on the left-hand two pins, and 3.3, which is what we'd need over here. However, 
that doesn't help you very much because these little things are not breadboard friendly. If you look underneath, they're connected with an eight-way dual header pin. The only thing you can plug into that is either these um, DuPont cables, which works quite well for testing. I'd certainly recommend that. Or you can go to your, your favourite Far Eastern supplier and get an adapter board, which once again isn't, isn't the cheapest thing in the world. But let me just show you this. Let's go over to the browser window. And here we have an adapter plate it says there look and you get two pieces well i got these from banggood it's uh, two pounds 18 so a pound a piece say so that's what one dollar 20 25 these days something like that it's not the cheapest thing in the world but it does work so it means you plug in the actual unit let me just switch back here so what we're going to do is take one of these with its with its pins so we wouldn't have any dupont cables and plug them directly into that socket you see there and then what that allows you is that you can put different cables well dupont cables again but from the top so these are your signal and data lines and here's your power and then you can put five volts in here because there's already a 3.3 on here um, oh, it says i can get a bigger picture let's have a look we can there we are that's a nice little picture so all the data signals are on here the ones you need anyway here's your power that's it bob's your uncle now, as it happens, I've got a couple of these on order, not for the video that I'm doing today. It would be a bit late, wouldn't it, really? But I've realised that this is the best I can do for, well, experimenting. But if I really want to put it into a project, which I do, then this is not really going to be satisfactory. So I've got a couple of those on order. Now, if you use the higher power ones, let me just show you one of those. Uh, something like this, look. See this one here? It's got this nice walkie-talkie style aerial. Now that's £3.26, so it is a little bit um, more expensive, isn't it? Let's have a bigger view of that. There we are. Now that's probably friendlier to use because it's got these pins on the top. Um, but then you are paying a bit more. But then the range also on these is significantly more. You can actually go up to 100 milliwatts on these and you would get well, easily a couple of kilometres out of that. So there we are, depending on what your need is, you have a choice. Right, so as I say, let's get back to uh, the workbench. What we're going to do is communicate with these two. OK, it's only going to be across six inches, but it, it works for about a metre and a half, the way I've got it set up at the moment. You need two identical Arduinos and, uh, well, two of everything, really. So you've got two transmitters, two lots of DuPont cables. If you haven't got DuPont cables, please, please, please watch the video that... I made ages ago about the sort of the basic necessities you need because you're going to need females at this end and then whatever it is you're connecting to. Now I haven't got a, a genuine Arduino here. These are all nanos, well clone nanos, onto development models. I find it very much easier to use these clone uh, boards because you've got a choice then of either pins or sockets. Now the sockets, okay, you'll get those on the standard one, but these pins, what it actually has on it is the signal that is to say you know d0 d1 d10 a7 whatever along this side and then you've always got the five volt and the ground right next to it on each one so you're never going to run out of supply pins so that's why i like these and, and they're nice and big as big as an arduino uno and it all makes it very easy to use right let me move these other bits out of the way now you've seen those and let's show you the code running and then we'll talk a bit more about the code now remember this is this is transceiver nrf 24 l01 uh, beginners 101 class the absolute minimum you can get away with just to prove it works because i think once you get this working even the way i've got it working now um, i think it will become fairly obvious how you'd adapt that to send more data but we'll talk look through the code in just a little while now i'm going to have to show you my monitor now rather than my code window because there's just so much going on we've got first of all we've got two instances here of the standard arduino ide okay so there's one here and one here now if you look on the debug window serial monitor one's running on com5 here right and one's running on com10 here now that's in some ways quite tricky to do you must launch each 
um, instance of this directly. Don't start going into file, um, open or recent or anything like that. that. That just makes another copy within this instance. It's really weird how that works. Go to your desktop and click the shortcut to load up one instance and open this particular uh, sketch. So this one I've called test node one. Okay, that's the uh, transmitting version. And this one over here is called test node zero. So you open up another instance, clicking the desktop shortcut and setting the port number to port 10. So one's running on port 10 and this one over here is running on port five. Now what you might find is that when you switch one, it actually changes the other one. And that's quite infuriating, but persevere and eventually it will give up and, and let you do it. Now, the other thing to notice, if you notice at the top here, is that I'm running Arduino 1.81. Now, at the time of making this video, at least, so February 2017, we seem to have jumped from 1.613. We didn't have any 1.7 as far as I know. We went straight to 1.81. And I found these easier to work with when trying to load up separate instances. But maybe that was just pure coincidence. Okay, so what you can see now is that this sketch is sending something and receiving something, whereas this sketch over here is just sending a response. Right, so what we've got here then is this side is the transmitter. This is on COM5, uh, yeah, COM5. And this one over here is on COM10, right? So this one's doing the transmitting, this one's just doing well, sort of an acknowledgement. But we'll talk about more about that in the code. Now, the the standard example sketch that comes with the library that we're going to use, as you can see here, it says RF24H. Um, you can do either. You can you can type something in the serial port window, and do either transmit or receive. But I found that well i personally found it a little bit confusing and secondly i thought well if i'm finding it a little bit difficult to follow and understand not that it's complicated i thought well you know we just we can't see the wood for the trees so what i've done is paired these two programs down to the ground as it were one does the transmission one does the reception and then sends something back as well so they both actually are transmitting so let's have a look at the code now now we can we can see obviously data is being transmitted between the two units. Um, we're sending a number out, it's just a random number, and then we're getting back that number plus one. So if you look here, it's sending 12, getting back 13, sending 44, getting back 45, and this is just saying what it's sending back. Okay, so it's working. So we've got the two sketches, that's great. I'll put these in the video links down below, that'll all be on GitHub. Uh, and it's time really just to have a look at the, the sketch itself and of course the RF24 library. Uh, the guy does an awful lot with these transmitters. You can have many, many, many transceivers all talking to each other in a very complex manner, but needless to say, I'm not covering that today. So let's go back to the code window now and just look at one of these at a time. We'll look at the transmit first, because that's probably the most interesting. Right, here we are then. Now this is, as I say, one of the uh, example sketches pared down to the ground, and I'm not trying to take credit for this. But anyway, we're using this RF24 library, so I'll put a link down where we can get that as well. Uh, let me just show you where that comes from, where you can get it. It's all on GitHub, as you might expect. So let me just uh, bring that up where we can get that from. So this is the well, the username of the person writing TMRH20, whoever he, she, it may be, Ukrainian Canadian programmer, anonymous though. But this is the library we want. As I say, there's there's other ones on here, as you can see. We're we're interested in this TFR24. Okay, these are all the ones are well slightly more advanced, but you may want to have a look at those. Right. So the RF24 then. This is the library. Just click on the clone, clone or download, download the zip, unzip it, rename it to RF24. When you get it, it'll say something like RF24 hyphen master and put that into your standard Arduino libraries folder. Back to the code then, because we're not actually going to look at this. Oh, well, apart from in the examples I was telling you about, uh, getting started. This is the one where well, I hacked basically to make two versions of that. 
want to transmit one, want to receive one, even though they both effectively are doing transmit and receive. But if you download my two programs, get them working, and you think, great, I understand now what it's doing, then you could well load this up. And it's an identical program, so you load the same program up in both instances of your sketch. All right, but that's that's somewhere down the line. Let's not go there. Right, let's carry on with the uh, the code analysis. So we're using standard SPI on there because both these run on SPI, of course. So that's pins 11, 12, and 13, uh, not 10 actually. That's probably me being a bit ambitious. <laughs> I think it's going to run all four. So it's 11, 12, 13, plus two further ones that he uses to switch the chip into enable mode, transmit mode, whatever. So we just leave that as is. This is the way of, um, well, he's chosen this way so to identify which node it is you're talking about. And it's the first digit that determines what the actual unit's going to do, whether it's the transmitting bit or the receiving bit. So I've just left those as they were because it just seemed too complicated to change, really. So we've got one and two and they're both nodes. Fine. OK, so on here, I've said this is the transmitter code. We're going to initialize all the code and everything. Now, if you notice here, I've got the PA level. This is the transmit level to absolute minimum. If you up that, there are other options. But if you put it any higher, you may well get problems, instability, or just won't work. Because as I say, these are only 3.3 volts. Your Arduino can probably give you, I don't know, something like 50 milliamps tops. So it might appear to work for a bit and then fail. Now, lots of people have soldered capacitors and what have you across these pins, but I just don't want to get into all that at this time. It works as it is now, like this, without any soldering in for capacitors anywhere, by putting it down to the minimum. Um, I've also set this up here. This is the fastest transmission rate it will give you, but also the shortest range. It can transmit at both 1 megabits per second and 250 kilobits per second. So if you use maximum power here and 250 uh, kilobits per second there, you'll get the longest range, which will probably give you, I don't know, perhaps a kilometre or near enough. But as I say, I'm playing about with these for a different reason anyway. So I wanted the shortest distance. And for a demo project like this, it will serve you well as well, I think minimum power so we don't interfere with anything and the fastest speed. Now channels, these are all operating between 2.4 gigahertz and 2.5 gigahertz. Yes, I hear you say, isn't my router running at that? Yes, it is. Your Wi-Fi will probably run at 2.4 something, but it doesn't extend all the way up to 2.5. So these units have effectively got 100 channels to choose from. Uh, in one megahertz uh, chunks, if you like. So we can start from zero to one, one, two, four. One, two, four then won't be affected by microwave ovens and Wi-Fi and stuff. So that's what I've used here to give you the best possible chance. Now, before you can transmit anything, we need to opera, open a pipe. And the pipe is an address. If you notice the addresses one and zero were declared up here. OK, they're unique and think of them like a well, like a port would be for your TCP IP. That is to say the address that your Internet connection is to web pages or web browsers go to port 80, but they don't have to. It's just convention. Um, so anything coming into your home or around your home network will use a network address plus a port. So that's what we're doing here. We're saying, well, we're on this channel here. But we're also got a very specific address, an address. And if it's not that an address, it won't respond. OK, but for this test unit, we've only got two, one node and two node. So if you were to type in there three node or something, it just wouldn't work. OK, right now what I'm doing is actually transmitting a random number from one to the other. So what I'm, I'm just seeding the random number generator at this point, OK, which you need to do, otherwise you'll get the same random numbers generated every time, which proves they're not random, of course, isn't it? Right, so the main loop, what's it doing? First of all, we go and get a random number, anything between 0 and 254. We have to say stop listening on the radio. The radio, remember, is the object that was declared way up the top here, here, okay, as part of the RF24 class. But if you, if you don't like classes and object-oriented, just think of this as a another 
variable, another way of getting hold of it. So the radio, we have to stop listening here. Yeah, so we stop listening every time. Then we transmit whatever it is. So the random character, say 56, we say, right, I want to transmit that value. Watch the ampersand in front of that, that um, variable name, because this is in fact uh, a point of reference to it. Let's not go there, just, just take it as red. That's what you've got to do. And it says, how big is your data? Well, I could have put one in there, but it sort of hides too much, I think. What we're saying is, whatever the size is of an unsigned chart, well, of course, it is one byte. So yes, all that comes down to one, but you might not want an unsigned chart. In fact, the original sketch transmitted a long value, which in fact, it had the milliseconds or microseconds or something. So it was many digits long. So that would take um, four bytes, was it eight? But I thought it's just too much. So we're going to transmit one data, one byte of data. That's how it knows how big it is by saying it's whatever the size an unsigned char takes, which is one byte. And then we listen. So having transmitted from here to here, the number 56, for example, we say, right, now I, this one here, am listening for whatever response you give me. Now, it's not going to listen forever, because otherwise it just hang, potentially. So we, we start, we grab whatever the current millis is. That is, how many milliseconds since we switched this little beauty on. And if you ask, yes, this could run for 49 days without running out of space to, to record that. And we're saying, whilst we haven't got any data, so we're still waiting for data to appear here from this one. So we're waiting. So we're saying, while we still haven't received any, we'll just check that we haven't waited for the 200 milliseconds yet and continue to wait and continue to wait, continue to wait. But the minute we do get some data available, it will come out of here and go down to here. Okay. Now, if we didn't get any data, we just return. Now return from this point, it's a little bit cheeky doing it like this. We're returning out of the loop to whatever called the loop. And one day I'm going to do a video on how all this hangs together. But just, just take it from me that there's something that calls the loop, a shell program, if you like, a sketch that calls our sketch. So that's just going to go back to it because if it hasn't received a response, there's nothing we can, we can say on screen. Assuming it does receive a response, though, it comes down here and says, right, OK, well, let's read that response. And we're going to get the data. Once again, watch the ampersand. Once again, we've got this. How big is the data coming back? Well, we know we're only sending one byte back. This is what I mean. Keep it simple, you see. We're sending a byte. We're getting a byte. And then we're just, in this bit here, just displaying to the serial port, as you've already seen, exactly what it is we've got back. We should be one more than what we sent. I haven't done any checking for that here because you can see it on the uh, serial monitor. Then we wait for a second and start the whole thing again. Right, so that's how the transmit works. Now there's one little bit in here that we sort of glossed over, this one here. We're saying, right, radio write. So we're writing the data, that's the pointer to our data variable, saying it's whatever's in that one there, go and, go and transmit it, one byte. But this radio.write returns a value back to say, not only did I transmit, but I got an acknowledgement, an automatic acknowledgement that the, the other end of to whom I'm transmitting received it. So what's happening is this one transmits, this one down here says, yeah, I got that, thanks. And then this one carries on with the code. Even though we're going to do some more work in here in a minute, you get this automatic acknowledgement, which of course is brilliant for us because we can transmit stuff and we know the other side's got it without us doing anything. If we didn't have any of this hanging around waiting for another response back and all this, it wouldn't matter because we know already that this radio.write has already confirmed that, we're, that the other end has received it. And not only has it received it, but it says, I've received it uncorrupted, and or if it did receive it corrupted and it wasn't correct, this would retry up to 15 times to send that packet again. Okay, now this is all very clever stuff, isn't it? And how they crammed in all that electronics into this thing is, is 
quite amazing. So what this is saying here is then, if I didn't manage to send and get an acknowledgement back, we'll just display a little message, but we'll still continue just, just in case we missed it. We wouldn't have done, but well. Okay, so that's what that's that little bit, and it's quite clever. And they've got all these comments in here just so that you can follow it through. Okay, now, there's not a lot. There we are. Look, there's only that little tiny bit of um, data. Obviously, this is a very, very, very simple sketch, and we're only sending one character, but we could send more. We could send an array of characters, um, which I could have then used in my cat run, for example, the time, the date, the temperature, the humidity, whether it's raining or not, and so forth. But that's for another day. Right, let's have a very quick look now at the receiving end, which is even simpler than this. Right, this is the receiver. So this is test node zero. And as it says down here, it says this is the receiver code. Okay, so on our little mock up here, it's this one over on the left hand side running on COM10. At least I hope it is. Yes, COM10. Good. Right. So what, this is almost a copy, well, the, the beginning bit most definitely is a copy of the other code. Does all the radio setup begin and all the rest of it, minimum power, two megabits, same channel, obviously, if you want to talk, remember, pretend these are walkie talkies, you've got to be talking on the same channel, haven't you? And you've obviously got to be talking and listening on the same pipe that the other one's listening to. So this is the opposite way around to the other sketch. We are opening a writing pipe on zero, whereas the other sketch opened it on one and we're opening a reading pipe on one, whereas the other one opened it on zero. Remember, think of these as a sort of a, a door. So we've got the street and these are the doors on that street. If you don't get the right one, nothing will happen. So we start listening because obviously this one is supposed to listen right that's the whole point of this and we want to get a single character so we say is there any data can i hear anything while there is data we go and read it okay now we've only got one character so that's all we're going to do it'll read one character there will not be any further data available we therefore stop listening i add one to that single character data plus plus so if we received 56 it will now go up to 57 and we write that back in exactly the same way as the transmitter originally sent it to us having sent it back we then start listening again now if you notice here we haven't said if not radio write so we're just we're just writing it out transmitting it into the ether so that it's coming from here to here now if that fails we don't know about it here because we haven't checked. We haven't bothered to check, let's put it that way. This would have given us an indication if only we'd bothered to check the return value from here, but we haven't. And I've deliberately done it that way just to show you that you don't have to check if you don't want to. And then we go back to listening mode to catch the next packet. And we just send a little response here to the serial monitor to say, this is what I sent back. So having gone through all that, let's look at the monitor window again here we are now these are our two outputs so this is sending back the response as we've just whoop, as we've just seen there that's the response that it's sending back and let me just uh, spread these out and this is the transmitter where it's sending a value making sure that the other end has actually received it before continuing but then receiving something back as well in fact it's one more so that's it really that's the very simplest sketches i could come up with that seemed to make sense to me for a beginner and you know i'm a beginner at doing this as well really so i think if i can understand this two separate sketches similar but not quite the same and two instances running like this sending stuff receiving stuff i reckon that makes sense so the only thing you've got to do if you want to make this say you're thinking yeah do you know what i like this i'm gonna i'm gonna do it how are you gonna do it right well the first thing you need then two of these nrf lo1 transmitters and i would advise just for playing about with get these one with the built-in aerial 
until you know that whatever project it is you've got in mind is going to work there's no point in forking out extra money on those super duper high power ones obviously you'll need two arduinos of some shape or form you'll need dupont cables and i would recommend you get the dupont cables and then use the same color scheme that um, i've chosen here so this is the connection from the top of these okay oh, this thing down here so the, and the reason those colors were chosen because I wanted red down here for VCC and if you look at the DuPont cables when they come in so I've got I've got lots of them here let me just pan back and you can buy these on eBay for well very very little money so if you wanted to start with a red as I did you're going to be restricted there aren't you it's going to go red brown black white gray right I was just watching that bit of the video and it was obvious that I'd done it the wrong way around so let's do that again look this is the um, DuPont cables and I should have been reading it that way not not the other way so I've chosen brown red so brown's the uh, ground red's the positive and then you know orange yellow green in that order anyway and you can literally just peel these off like that and uh, plug them in now as it happens I'm just stopped the video just for that I've also received those um, sockets today look so there's a little socket you can see it's just a little thing like this um, it's now five volts in not 3.3 .3, which makes it a lot easier for us arduinites to uh, get the right voltage that just plugs in there and the cable sequence the coloring sequence that i seem to have so much trouble with has been honored here so they haven't mucked around with the order of the pins in other words so that's it very quick thing look there we are oh one last thing because it's got a little light on it you see these haven't got lights on which is a shame really isn't it you can't really tell they're actually running but anyway that's got a little light on so you show you've got power to it and uh, well it just makes it a lot neater doesn't it now you could literally mount that in a project box or something um has it got any holes got some very very tiny holes there um i don't know you might want to just put those onto a circuit board and solder them on or stick it down whatever but it's certainly a lot easier doing it like that than it is with the original one like this you can't really use this one at all but you can use this one that's it that's all i wanted to say right let's get back to the main video so that's that's why these colors are the way they are because that's the way they happen to be on the dupont cables starting with red so in fact it goes red black yellow orange blue green can't tell what color oh gray and purple so that's what it is now there is in fact one pin there you notice it says irq we don't connect that at all 20 pin in fact just just to stop the questions coming yes i've connected it to this pin here because that socket on here is not connected to anything on this particular expansion board it's not connected rather than just leaving it dangling in midair ready to touch something it shouldn't touch i've put it on there right so you need two of those and to be quite honest although you can connect them up like this and that's great for demo prototyping I think just to prove the point and if you've got a, a project in mind you can do this really easily and it, it's not going to take you that long a couple of hours and you'll probably be there especially if you use the sketches that i've given you and remember to load up two instances directly from the desktop shortcut that's going to be fairly easy but i would recommend if you're going to order these you might as well order the adapter plates to go with them because you'll most certainly need those as you go on okay just to refresh your memory let's have a look at those there we are that's what they are that's what the two i bought now of course if you buy more of these they do go down in price quite a, quite quickly um these as i say are a pound a piece because i bought two but if you bought 10 for example they get into something like 60 pence now if we just have a look here again and go back one that was the high power transmitter there we are look five pieces here a four pound and a penny so that'd be about what five dollars for five a dollar a piece that's pretty good isn't it and the actual transmitters here's one whoop, one here for one pound 38 but if you buy more than that let's have a look if they do them in bulk here i know they do some oh, they're here a lot you can get 20 of them as an example unlikely you'll need 20 but uh, you might be in a school for example or a college you might better share them out with your your schoolmates or something so you can get 20 for 13.69 which is probably about i don't know about 16 17 dollars something like that perhaps a tad more but whatever you can see that the price drops fairly quickly let's just have a little demo now of what happens 
when it runs out of range. So there we are, it's all running quite happily. Right, I'm going to take this one to the far end of the desk. Let's take it off here and move it whoop, without destroying the setup. I'm going to move it far away. Whoa, there we are. Now, let me just kill that over there. Now, look at this. You see, it's saying I haven't had a, res a response now and I'm not getting a response because it's too far. As I said, the range is quite limited. Let me bring it back there. Now, look, I've lifted it above my desk and it's quite happy again. Well, well, sort of happy. That's it. So now it's probably, ooh, it's probably about 60 centimetres apart, two foot apart, and it's quite happy. If I start moving it further, it loses that, which is great because I want it for that because we're on minimum power. And just for testing purposes, I think that's enough. If you do want to go up one level in power, I'll put a link to the, um, the data sheet or, or the information in that RF24 um, library, and then you can move up one level. I think I've got it as min power. Um, you can put it up to, I think it's low power. Where do we set that? Here, that's here. So I've set it to PA-min. You can set it to PA-low. But as I've said before, if you start getting problems with these units because they suddenly stop working or something, that's probably because it, your Arduino just can't supply enough power. Okay, but those little adapter plates will get you around that problem. Right, okay, that will do for an intro. Um, if you got this far, I think you'll probably immediately see how useful it would be to transmit more data, but that's just to get things working. And already I've got a project in mind that I want to do. Whether it comes to anything, well, we'll find out in a few months, I think, the way my uh, productivity is going at the moment. So that was an intro to the NRF24 L01 Plus transceiver module. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching. I hope you're finding these videos useful and interesting. There are plenty more videos to choose and a couple are shown below. And if you'd like to subscribe to this channel, just click on my picture below and enjoy the rest of the videos. Thanks for watching.